and psalmist exalts people to praise him because he is worthy to be praised our god is worthy to be honored and there is no one like him he is a great god he's turned my morning into dancing and he's turned my sorrows into joy and as we are in the presence of the lord just like sister martina was saying forget about our past forget about those guilt that you carry in christ we are free we are free and we are here to worship him we are here to lift his name on high so let us dedicate ourselves surrender ourselves as we sing thank you lord thank you lord worship Bless the name of the Lord. That's what the psalmist says. For as long as I live, your praises shall be on my lips. Your praises shall be on my lips. For every breath that I take and every moment that I am awake is by the mercy and the grace of the Lord. The Lord requires faithfulness, righteousness, and holiness from our lives. So this morning, let us pray to the Lord that, Lord, you take my heart and you form it. 
You take my mind and transform it. Take my will, O God, confirm it to the will of yours. Your will, your will be done. And holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Holiness, holiness is what you want. says, Lord, you are the master of all, and I humble myself. And brokenness, brokenness is what I long for. Brokenness is what I need. Brokenness, brokenness is what you want from me. So take my heart and form it. Take my mind and take my mind. Transform me. Take my will. Take my will. Confort. Take my heart and take my heart and form it. Take my mind. 
to your, to your. Take my heart and mold it, O oh God. Change my heart that I may not dwell on my past, that I may look forward, I may look up to you, Lord, the author and the perfecter of my faith. Oh, holy, holy. Are you Lord God Almighty? What is the land? What is the land? And you are holy, holy. Are you Lord God? We are here in your presence, O oh God, seeking your face, seeking your presence in all of our lives. Just like we've sung, O oh Lord, we are thankful, we are grateful. Our hearts are full of gratitude, O oh God. When we look at the ways in which you have led us, you seek faithfulness from our lives, you seek righteousness, you seek brokenness from our lives, O oh Lord. And our prayer this morning is, that with the help of the Holy Spirit, we would be able to mold our hearts, not by our own might, not by our own strengths, but by the strength that we receive from you, Lord. Our prayer is that, Lord, our will would be confirmed to the will of yours. And our prayer is, Lord, as long as we have breath, we would be singing holy 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 is the lord god almighty worthy is the lamb that was slain praises be to the lamb that was slain for our sins may we be able to declare your goodness and your glory and be able to praise you lord as long as we live as we spend the rest of the moment in your presence pray that you would speak to all of our hearts give you all glory, honor, and praises. And we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. If you all may be seated, please.
I thank God for this <coughs> day that God has given us to be in his presence, to worship him and also to meditate on the, on the word that we have read just now. Romans chapter 8. Uh, last week we were looking at Romans chapter 7 and we all know <coughs> how Brother Roji very beautifully put that to all of us that how the law and uh, the, uh, how the law is not able to save us. And he said uh, that the law is not able to save us because uh, the law can only show where you have gone wrong, but it cannot save us is what we were looking at. So in Romans chapter 7, what we find is that we, we find Paul's frustration. In fact, you know, when you look at Romans chapter 7, there are so much of I, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want, but yet I'm not able to do. You know, he, he says that. And uh, so the frustration of Paul living in his flesh, and many times, you know, we also come to that, that kind of frustrations. We want to do some certain things and we are not able to do that. And in chapter 7 and verses 15, Paul says, I do not understand what I do. For I, what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, I do. You know, I want to get up early in the morning and pray, but I do not do. I'm in the flesh. And I don't want to get angry at my son or my daughter. I, I resolve in myself, I should not do that, but then I end up, I end up doing it. So Paul, you know, we, we find the frustration that is, that is there, miserably failing at times. And so Paul is coming to two conclusions in chapter 7. One of the conclusions that Paul is coming to is 7 verses 18. And it says there, I know that nothing good lives in me. Nothing. And that's the conclusion many times even I have come to. You know, I tell many people, if there was no God factor in my life, there's nothing good in me. <laughs> life is all messed up. You know, life is a mess without, without God. And that's the conclusion that Paul also brings in chapter 7 and verses 18. He says, there's nothing good that, that lives in me. I'm a mess. And then the second conclusion that he makes is in verses 24. He says, I'm a wretched man. What kind of a man I am? I'm a wretched man. Now, many times we also, looking at our past, we come to that kind of a conclusion that I'm a wretched man. I don't know how many of you have played this, this, this game, but uh, we used to play when I was in school. Uh, there's this daisy flower we have, and we, you remember that? We used to play, you know, that girl is attracted to you, or you like that girl. Okay, let's say, she loves me, she loves me not. She loves me, and she loves me not. And in the end, what, what comes up, and then, I, I suppose, yeah, you, you're all smiling. You, you know, we all have played that kind of game when we were growing up. Many times in our relationship with God, you know, we have that kind of thing. He loves me, he loves me not. When I am in sorrow, when I am in trouble time, my conclusion is, he loves me not. But when I am in good times, my conclusion is, he loves me. Many times we carry that kind of doubt, that kind of confusion in us. So chapter 7, if you look at chapter 7 as uh, Brother Roji was sharing last time, it is all, as I said, all I, I, me, mine, <coughs> very self-conscious. He's saying, you know, the struggle with my flesh, it's me. 47 times, around 47 times, there is this personal pronoun, I, the mindset of those people trying to please God or to be justified in the, in the energy of their flesh. But when I realize that I'm a wretched man, when I realize that I'm a mess, I need someone to help me, right? I need uh, a person to come and help me. And that's what he answers in verses 25 of chapter 7. And he says, but thanks be to God that through Jesus Christ, I'm no more a mess. I'm no more a wretched man. And so he comes to chapter 8. You know, he, there's a transition to chapter 8. This messed man is no more a messed man. This wretched person is no more a wretched person. I was longing to preach from chapter 8. You know, when I began this journey in October, I just wanted to preach from chapter 8. Because chapter 8 is one chapter that tells you that you are no more a wretched man. That you are no more a mess. So we begin chapter 8. And somebody has said like this, that Romans chapter 8 is the chapter of chapters for all believers. Chapter of chapters. If scripture was a golden ring, if this Bible was a golden ring, 
book of Romans would be diamond on that ring and chapter 8 would be the sparkle on the diamond of that ring. That much valuable, that much beautiful is chapter 8 of Romans, the book of Romans. So Paul begins by talking about our position in Christ Jesus. Who are we in Christ Jesus? Are we messed up? Are we wretched? Are we foolish? Are we people without any hope? So he begins with our position in Christ Jesus. And verses, uh, chapter 8, verses 1, he says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8 begins with no condemnation. And if you look at Romans chapter 8, how it closes. Romans chapter 8, if you see how it closes, the last verse, it says, there is no separation. For those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no separation with Christ. What a beautiful verse that is. What a beautiful verse that is. It, is, it gives us more value. That we who are in Christ Jesus are not condemned. That we are who are in Christ Jesus are not separated. Now, something that is unique in this chapter 8 is, there is a mention of the Spirit of God, Holy Spirit. Around 20, 20 times the word Holy Spirit is mentioned. As I said, chapter 7 is full of I. And when you come to chapter 8, it is full of Holy Spirit. I am not condemned because of what I do, I am not condemned because of the Holy Spirit. Because of my position in Christ Jesus. Now before chapter 8, there is only one mention of Holy Spirit. That is chapter 5 verses 5. But here as I said, around 20 times, Paul is mentioning Holy Spirit. The remarkable mystery of the ministry of Holy Spirit. You don't see Holy Spirit, uh, you know, if I ask, do you see Holy Spirit? We don't see Holy Spirit. But our position in Christ Jesus has been changed from that of a mess to that of not being condemned by the mysterious ministry of the Holy Spirit. Because you are placed in Christ Jesus. What a marvelous declaration that is for all of us. Now the word condemnation is a legal term. You know, you, you've been given a verdict, a guilty verdict. And then you receive the penalty of that verdict. You stand before a judge. And Paul says, you don't receive any penalty. All your penalty has been. Now isn't that a wonderful declaration to say that none of your guilty works that you did would receive a penalty. It has already been paid. Now that, that, is, that is kind of an impossibility. How is it possible that all that I have done in the past, all the guilt that I was carrying is, is already been paid. And that's why he says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. For those who are in Christ. Now, another Paul's favorite phrase, in Christ, en Christo. That is around 87 times Paul mentions this, this phrase, in Christ. For those who are in Christ, there is no condemnation. We already see, saw that in chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, if you remember. We said those who die with Christ. Those who are raised with Christ. They are identified with Christ. Now we are all are identified with Christ. Now you are all in Christ. And if you are in Christ, you should be confident of this fact. That is, there is no condemnation on you. The penalty has been paid. The verdict has already been declared. That you are not a condemned person. So Paul in chapter 8 begins with, he doesn't say that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me not, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me not. And we do not, we do not come to that kind of a conclusion that Jesus loves me not because my situation is bad. But we always declare this fact that I am no more condemned. I am Why I am no more condemned? And he, he would go on to say, talk about that in the, in the, in the following verses of Romans chapter 8. Jesus met my condemnation so that he might transfer to me his righteousness. And when God looks at me, he looks at me as a righteous person. Because Jesus' righteousness has been imparted to me. And when God looks at me, he looks at me as a righteous man and a righteous woman. What do, what do we owe? Or did we owe this? Did we ever owe this? That we could be called as a righteous children of God? Never at all. If God would look at or take an account of the accounts that we did... We could truly say with Paul that I am a wretched man, I am a mess. 
what good it is in me. And then he goes on to say that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So before I begin or before I go to the, the preceding word, the, the following verses, you've got to make this fact short of that I am in Christ. And when I am in Christ, I am no more condemned. And then in verses 2 onwards, Paul is going to talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit does in my life and the mysterious ministry of Holy Spirit. Because I am in Christ. Now, when you accepted Christ as your personal Savior, Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You know, at that moment, we know, we, we studied this, that God gives his Holy Spirit inside of you. You have the Holy Spirit inside. Now, Holy Spirit is not, as many people misunderstand this, it is not just limited to speaking in tongues. Many people say that Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. It is not. It is, it, it, it is, it is not even an evidence that you have the Holy Spirit inside. The evidence is the fruit of the Spirit, I would rather say. <laughs> if we don't have the fruit of the Spirit ministering or working from in our lives, then we don't have Holy Spirit inside of us. I would, I would explain that as we go by. So those who are in Christ Jesus, Holy Spirit is inside of us. And because the Holy Spirit is inside of us, Paul goes on to explain what this Holy Spirit does. The first thing, and we will look at that, the first thing in verses 2, he says, Holy Spirit frees us from sin and death. Holy Spirit frees us from sin and death. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. It begins by four. Why are you not condemned? Why you are not condemned? Why when God looks at you, he says that you're not condemned? The reason, he says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which means the Holy Spirit, is referring to Holy Spirit. For Holy Spirit has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now when we talk about law, there are two kinds of law. One kind of law is a dictation, a dictate, a regulation, right? For example, I say that the law prohibits me to go at a high speed. The law says that. Or maybe mosaic law, right? We say that mosaic law says that you got to do this, you got to, you should not do this. The law, the dictation, the regulation. But on the other hand, the law is also meant by a a motivation, a principle, you know, a motivation and a principle. So Paul here is describing a principle of spiritual life, like the law of gravity. Now, for the law of gravity, you don't have to ask the law of gravity to exert its influence, right? You don't have to say law of gravity, I am throwing this phone from down, so you should fall. We don't say that. It does, right? It, it, it falls on its, on its own. Do we ever command the phone, phone fall down and it falls down. It doesn't happen that way, right? You don't have to urge the law of gravity to exert its effect. It does it because it's it, it is its natural function. In the same way, the natural function of the law of the spirit, the natural function of the Holy Spirit is to confirm you to the image of Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Now, if the Holy Spirit is inside of us, we would be confirmed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's the natural function of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Paul says here. For the Holy Spirit, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Now when I'm in, a, in my natural self, when I work in my flesh, the natural tendency is to do something wrong. But Paul says, now you have you don't have the natural self. You have something else inside of you. And what is that? That is, that is the Holy Spirit. Now, we, when we go to the airports, right, uh, we see so many airplanes parked. We know that the law of gravity means that when you throw something down, it should, there's a, there, there's a gravitational pull. You know, it, it pulls it down. But then when the engines are, when the engine is started and when you try to, you know, uh, move this flight, slowly the flight goes up because there is another law that is at work and that is the law of thermodynamics. All those who study physics and maths, you know it, right? Th that does not mean that the gravitational pull is not there, but there is a higher law. There is a law of thermodynamics. Uh, 
aerodynamics or thermodynamics. Yeah, whatever it is. I, I hope you got it. <laughs> so there is another law that is at work. The law of gravity is still there, but there is another law. There is a higher law. And that's what Paul says. You who are in Christ Jesus have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And that Holy Spirit sets you free from the law of sin and death. So in essence, what Paul is saying is that am I free because of my positive thinking? No way. Am I free because of my po positive mental imagining? No way. Am I free because I'm trying harder to be free? I go to church every Sunday. I observe all the traditions that I'm supposed to observe. In my, in my flesh, I'm trying to be free. Am I free because of that? Paul says, no way. Because you are in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit that is inside of us frees us from the law of sin and death. We are free by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He lives in us and he, he enables us to fly high. It is because of Christ Jesus you are no more condemned. It is because of Christ Jesus you can soar on high, you can fly on high. Back in America in September 22, 1862, Abraham Lincoln had uh, presented an emancipation proclamation saying that from now on there won't be any slavery. Uh, that Emancipation Proclamation was proclaimed in 1862, September 22nd. But you know what? People lived their life just like before. They were still living in slavery. Everybody was living in slavery. The reason was there was a civil war that was going on. And those were not the days of uh, Twitter or uh, social media like Facebook or newspaper. Nobody had all of those things. And nobody even declared that news that slavery has been abolished. Slaves were living as though, but there is already, always already a declaration had been made that slaves, you are free. But it did not get into the system of the slaves. And the reason, probably the reason could be majority of the slaves, they were not able to read, they couldn't read, and nobody had the news to uh, carry. The war ended in April 1865. 1862, this declaration was made, War ended in 1865. It was only in December 1865 that people got the news that slavery has already been abolished. Three years from when it was already declared. Many times we live our lives in such a way. We think that we are condemned. We think we still live in the guilt. We still carry that guilt in us that we are condemned. It has already been declared that if you are in Christ Jesus, You've been set free from the law of sin and death. That we don't die. Even if we die, we live. Now, it, 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 it seems to be shocking to us, right? We would say three years er earlier it was declared, but still people are living in slavery. Even after accepting Christ as our personal savior, even after Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death, many times we still are like those slaves under the grip of Satan, under the grip of condemnation, thinking that we are condemned. But may I tell you this morning, if you are in Christ Jesus, you're no more condemned. Your punishment has already been paid. The Holy Spirit inside of you has set you free from the law of sin and death. And so you can, you can very boldly say, oh death, where is your sting? The death can never sting us. That death can never come and whisper in your ears to say that this is your end. Because what you're going to do is, what you're going to declare is, I am free by the law of the spirit of life Jesus, of Jesus that lives in me. So that's the first thing that the Lord does, the Holy Spirit does. We were looking at what the Lord does in chapter 7. In chapter 8, we are looking at what the Holy Spirit does. First thing the Holy Spirit does is sets us free from the law of sin and death. Verses 3 and 4, the second thing that the Holy Spirit does. It enables us to fulfill the law. It says in verses 3 and 4, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned the sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, this verse also begins with a 
with a cause, for, it begins with for, which is an explanation of verses 2. How I have been set free? Now each verse is a for, it begins with for, right? Why am I not condemned? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free. How am I set free? For, it begins here for. Because Jesus Christ has done for us the things that should have been done on our behalf or the things that we were supposed to do. God did what the law could never do. You know, the law set forth a requirement, right? But law could not keep that requirement. The law says, got to do this, got to do this. The law is designed to do that. But the weakness of the law is not in the law. It is in the sinful. It is in my sinful nature. Last week, Brother Roji had explained about that. The law tells me this I should do. And when I don't do what the law tells me to do, whose fault it is? Is it the law's fault or my fault? It is? Is it the law's fault? No, it is my fault, right? It is my fault. The law is asking me, I should do this, I should not do this. But when I'm not able to do those things, whose fault it is? It is not. So that's what Paul says in chapter 7. The law is not bad. The law is okay. The law is fine. But the problem is with me. In my flesh, I'm not able to fulfill the requirements of the law. So the requirements of the law has been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. What the law required you and me to do, it has already been fulfilled. Who did it? Jesus Christ. And so if you are in Christ Jesus, you are no more condemned. Because the law has already been fulfilled. You have already fulfilled that. It is just like a law is just like a 10 feet pole. Just imagine a 10 foot pole. You don't come to that pole and tell the pole that, see, I'm a six feet man. Could you please change me to 10 feet? The pole cannot do it, right? The, all that the pole can do is to measure you and say that how short you are, how much more you have to gain to reach up to that 10 pole. That's what the law does. You know, the law would never help you to come to that, to, to, to that height. That's what the law does. And all the requirement, and the pole required us me to be 10 feet. All that requirement that the law required was fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And as I already said, the law was right to find fault in me. But God took away my fault and applied it to Jesus Christ. That's why I say, you know, when we remember the cross, when we remember the Calvary, we cannot be quiet. It just, it just overwhelms us. It just overwhelms us. That something that I did not deserve, God did it on my behalf in Christ Jesus. And that makes us more grateful. Otherwise, I just imagine if Christ was not there, if Christ had not come on my behalf to take my sins, the law required me to die because I cannot fulfill the requirement of the law. And the end result is I must die. But praise be to God, I am no more enslaved to death. Why? Because Christ Jesus took my sins and he was the fulfillment or he fulfilled the requirements of the law. Verses 4 also contains that purpose clause, for, if you read verses 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, by us, through us. What does it say? Righteous requirement of the law would be met by us. Does it say by us? Yes, please. It says, the righteous requirement of the law should be met in us. If it says by us, that means I am doing. The requirements of the law, I am doing. I am doing all the work. It does not say by us. It does not say through us. It says in us. The righteous requirement of the law has been met in us. Those who are in Christ Jesus. That's why you and I, we are no more condemned. We must be careful when we read that portion because it does not say that righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled through us. It says the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us. The third thing the Holy Spirit does, verses 5 through 11. 
The Holy Spirit changes our nature. The first thing we looked at was Holy Spirit sets us free from the law of sin and death. Second thing we looked at was the Holy Spirit. What does it do? Yes, it, it enables us to fulfill the, the law. The requirement of the law is death. It, it's already been fulfilled. And then the third thing the Holy Spirit does is it changes our nature. Verses 5 through 8. Let me read that for all of us. 5, five through 8. For those who are in accord with the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are in accord with the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. For it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And God says there are two kinds of people. People have two nature. One is mind set on the flesh. And another is mind set on, set on the spirit. God does not divide people based on caste, color, ethnicity, or you name it. God divides people based on these two nature, and that is it. Either you are of the flesh or you are of the spirit. If you are of the spirit, you are in Christ Jesus. And if you are not in Christ Jesus, the spirit doesn't live in you. You are of the flesh. So there is a contrast that Paul gives here. God has changed our nature from that of the flesh to that of the spirit. You are no more. You don't belong to the flesh anymore if you are in Christ Jesus. And that's what, that's what Paul says there. There is a contrast. Now what it means to be fleshly minded and spiritually minded. You are of the flesh and you are of the spirit. Now how you think. If you are of the flesh, how you think will affect the way you live. If you are of the spirit, how you think will affect the way you live. And when Paul describes the people who live by flesh, he means that people who live for their flesh and people who seek to live by their flesh. For their flesh and by their flesh. Uh, I hope you, you are getting the difference. When Paul says people who live by the flesh, it means people who live for their flesh and people who live by their flesh. For their flesh means all that you think is just your flesh. How to satisfy your flesh. By their flesh is, you try to please God by your flesh. So in everything you do, you are dependent on what? You're dependent on flesh. Day in and day out, you're thinking about your flesh. How would I eat? What would I wear? And this is what I must do. You are just gratifying the desires of the flesh. You are living for your flesh. And by your flesh is, you think that on your own, the ways that I do, you know, the, the hard work that I do, the hard work that I, that I put in would please God. So you live in your flesh and, and the Bible talks about it. If you look at Luke chapter 12 and verses 22, Luke chapter 12 and verses 22, somebody please help me in reading Luke 12, 22. Luke 12, 22. Yes. Yes. So Jesus says, do not worry about all these things, what you eat, what you wear, what you, what you drink and all of those things. Life is much more than that. We already looked at that. So all those who live in their flesh, just to think about their flesh, Jesus is saying, it is futile. And also some people who try to please God by their flesh. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul is talking about them. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. People who live in the flesh to please God by their flesh. Galatians chapter 3 and verses 1 to 3. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning with the spirit? Are you not now try to attain your goal by the human effort? Are you trying to please God by your human effort? Are you trying to please God by your flesh? So people who live by the flesh always think about the flesh. 
people who live by the flesh would try to please God by their flesh. And Paul says that the mind that is governed, let's come to chapter 8, and Paul says the mind set on what the nature desires, and he says that mind leads to death. That mind leads to death. Or death in this, in this uh, connotation would be barrenness, fruitlessness, spiritual poverty, and that is a stench in the nostrils of God. And he also says the mind that is led by flesh is hostile to God, is an enemy of God. So if you are led by the flesh, you are destined to die. If you are led by the flesh, you think about the things of the flesh. If you are led by the flesh, you are an enemy of God. Now Solomon find, found this, this principle, you know, he was trying to seek to please his flesh and which resulted in his, in his barrenness, in his fruitlessness. And at the end of his life, he comes to a point, conclusion to say that everything is vanity, everything is vain. I'm trying to live to please the desires of my flesh and I am, I am a vain. Now in verses 9 through 11, there is a change. He talks about the spirit, those who live by the spirit. And who has enabled that? It is God through the Holy Spirit. We were once living in flesh. We were people of the flesh, trying to gratify the desires of the flesh, always thinking about the flesh. But now, if you look at verses 9, there's a change in how Paul addresses them. In verses 5, he was saying, those who live according to the flesh. But now in verses 9, how does he, how does he address them? If you look at verses 9, how does he address them? Does he say those? Does he say they? What, what, what does he say? He says you, but those you who are in the spirit. There's a change of address. He does not call them they, he calls them you, believers, you who are in spirit. You're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Verses 9 says, you are in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. That's the answer of chapter 7, verses 24. When Paul says, who could save me, a wretched man? The answer of that, who would deliver me from the body of death? And Paul says, the Holy Spirit that dwells in you. The Holy Spirit that dwells in us. Spirit in me and I in the Spirit. A mutual indwelling, you know. At one point of time, I was in, in, in another environment. My environment was different. It was all about flesh. I was just thinking about flesh and flesh and flesh. How to gratify the desires of my flesh. That was it. But now he says that it is a Holy Spirit that changed your interest. The change your nature. It's the Holy Spirit. Now he's put you in the Spirit. The Spirit dwells in you. And you dwell in the Spirit. And that's what it says. The Spirit who's made His dwelling in us is the Holy Spirit that resides in us. The Holy Spirit that dwells in us. Not only are we now in the Spirit, in the spiritual environment, uh, not only are we now in the spiritual environment, but the Spirit also lives in us. The word dwell there is to make a home. Can you imagine the Holy Spirit has made a home in us, all those who are in Christ Jesus? And Paul very categorically talks about that in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15. 1 Corinthians. Could somebody please help me reading 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 15. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. Now look at the places we go. Can you just imagine? You're taking the Holy Spirit also with you to those places. Because if you're in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And to those places where we are not supposed to go, to those things which we are not supposed to do, how much are we grieving the Holy Spirit? Because Paul says the Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells in us if you are in Christ Jesus. And that can only happen when you, you rever Jesus as the Lord of your life. Verses 10 and 11. If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Verses 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, 
He who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Paul says the body is dead, meaning it is subject to death because of sin. And because of sin, these bodies are dying. It is dying away, it's fading away, right? You look yourself, the other day I was looking at uh, my photo album. And I was looking six years from before this, this time. Six years previous to this time. And I was like, man, I am aging. I am aging. I look at my, the, the wrinkles on my face and I'm saying, I'm aging. The body is dying. The body is decaying. But the spirit never dies. And that's, that's, that's a blessed assurance. You know, Paul gives there. Your spirit never dies. It is living. And it is living not because of our own efforts. It is living because of the power of Jesus that raised Jesus from dead, gives life to your spirit. You're not dead anymore because you are not living in the flesh, gratifying the desires of the flesh. You are in the spirit because you always look to the spiritual realm. And that's what Paul always, he used to talk about, you know, living in the spirit, living in the spirit. We live in the spirit because of Christ Jesus. And that was the heart, that was the heart of uh, Paul's prayer. We don't have time to read that. Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 19. We are no longer under the control of sinful nature. But we are under the control of the indwelling spirit of God. <clears throat> the spirit of God lives in us and makes us to do the things that we are supposed to do because of the spirit that lives in us. Now, for an example, if a toddler, we know... Uh, when, when, when a child, you know, tries to walk, I've seen my daughter, when she was trying to walk, we used to encourage her to walk. You know, we were scared that she, if, what happens if she doesn't walk? So we used to make her walk. But she always used to find comfortable not to walk, but to crawl. But still we used to make her walk. Please walk, keep walking. But still she will crawl. And then she'll go to the, the old nature, what she had. Just imagine if she kept on crawling, even if she got into a, to a good age, what would have happened? Doesn't mean that we struggle with, we don't struggle with flesh. We do struggle with flesh. But we are in a new environment, the spiritual environment. The spirit in us ministers to us. And that new environment has freed you from the law of sin and death. You are no more under the control, under the dominion of sin. You are no more reigned by sin. It is a spirit that is over you, spirit that is mastering over us. And that's what makes us to exhibit the fruit of the spirit. Because the Holy Spirit helps us. And that's what makes Paul say that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He doesn't stop there. Verses 12 and 13. The Holy Spirit empowers us to victory. Verses 12 and 13. He says, so then brothers and sisters, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh for if you're living in accord with the flesh you are going to die but if by the spirit you are put, putting to death the deeds of the body you will live Paul is simply saying you have no obligation to your old self you know we have no obligation to the flesh we, I, I, I cannot say that you know the flesh is asking me to do this so I have are we any, under any obligation to flesh? No way. But we are under obligation to someone else. Who? To the Holy Spirit. We are under obligation to Christ. Who has changed our nature from that of flesh to that of the Spirit. We are no more under the dominion of the Spirit. You know, the old man inside of us will say, what about me? The flesh will say, what about me? Feed me. I need you to feed me. The old man inside of us would say that because that is our natural self. That is who we are. That is how we were born. But we are no more under the dominion of the flesh. He says you have an accountability and obligation to the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. It is the Holy Spirit that has changed our nature from that of the flesh to that of the, of, of the Spirit. No, we are either progressing in our relationship with Jesus Christ or we are regressing. We are going down. If we examine our own lives, either we are progressing or we are regressing. No, the life with Jesus Christ, the walk with Jesus Christ is, like, is just like, you know, you ride a bicycle on a mountain, you know, uphill. When I stop pedaling, what would happen? It will go 
it will go down when I stop pedaling. So I stay at it just one foot in front of other. Keep going. Keep walking in the Lord. We keep walking in the Lord. I exercise the fruit of the Spirit. I allow the Holy Spirit to minister to me, to work in me. It is the Holy Spirit that gives us victory, not we on our own selves. I on my own cannot be victorious over the flesh because that's what my nature is. That's what my flesh will ask. Feed me and I feed my flesh in my own nature. But I ask the Holy Spirit to come and help me to give me victory over the things of the flesh, the things of the flesh that flesh would love to do. Now, if we plant a flower, you know, uh, any flower, if we plant, we got to do a little gardening, right? If we don't guard, do the gardening, if we don't water the plant, what would happen? The plant would die. But on the other hand, for you to grow a weed, it is not difficult, right? It will grow on its... Nobody, I mean, the house next to our house, before they were making... I mean, now it's a, it's a beautiful house. But before that, one fine day, he grazed everything. It was all... A fine, clear garden, I mean, very clear. But after two weeks, I find that there are weeds and weeds. I couldn't see the, the flat surface. It was all, I mean, nobody watered, nobody gardened. That is its natural self. And in our natural self, we are prone to commit sin. We are prone to feed the flesh. But we need the empowering of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to minister to us so that we can, we can, you know, we can satisfy our, our, our spiritual dominion, and that is Christ Jesus. And that we cannot do on our own. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Gives us victory. And the last thing, verses 15 through 17. Somebody please help me in reading verses 15 through 17. Uh, maybe verses, yeah, 14 to 17, please. Now, the Holy Spirit confirms our adoption. We are adopted. We are adopted children. No more the enemies of God. No more strangers to God. The term adoption is a very important New Testament term. We are adopted. Now, when we think adopted, oh, adopted is a secondary child, right? That, that, that kind of a thing comes to our mind. Adoption. Uh, he is not a natural child, but secondary child. But in Roman terms or in New Testament term, adoption is as equal to a natural child son the adopted son would be as precious as valuable as legal as the natural son so whenever the you know the land was divided it would go to the adopted son as equal to that of the natural son that was the that was how adoption was meant adopted son would lose all his right all his privileges of his previous family and then he would join to this adopted family and he will get all the privileges of the adopted family. Holy Spirit confirms our adoption. It says you will be even become a co-heir with Christ Jesus. Can you imagine that? The Holy Spirit does it. Christ, the Son of God, you and I, we are the children of God. Look at the language there. When I read that passage and the language it says, you and I, we are sons and daughters of God. We are children of God, co-heirs with Christ Jesus. He is the natural son and we are adopted children. We share the same privileges that he carries and I also carry. What a blessed privilege that is. It is not because of our own might. It is not because of our own strength. It is not because of any human efforts that we do. It is only and only by the strength of the Holy Spirit to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul says there. For a Jewish mind, it was very difficult to understand this phrase because a Jew would never have the words of God on their lips. You know, they would never even proclaim the words of God. And here Paul says, the Spirit has allowed you to call him Abba, Father. 
isn't it a great privilege where they would only they they would they would even even skip the name of god when it comes to the name of god they would even pronounce it because that that holy god was but paul says it is because of the holy spirit you have become adopted children of god and you can call him abba father so intimate a relationship that father and child father and sons and daughters it has happened only because of the holy spirit and that makes paul say there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in christ jesus we would question time and again that who can save this wretched man as i am we would question that without god i am a mess but be sure of this fact that you are no more condemned because you are in christ jesus you are no more condemned your condemnation has been paid by christ jesus this is a privilege that we carry this is something that we got to we we got to be proud of but at the same time it gives us a responsibility as well not something to brag about a responsibility that there are many out there who are still under condemnation who are still in that flesh nature who are still in their natural selves and that should give us a burden that lord they also should come to the spiritual self they also should come in the spirit under the dominion of the spirit they also should come in christ jesus you know everything that jesus has received by divine right as a unique son of god you and i we have received it by divine grace as the adopted children of god when i when i read this statement it just it just it just made me thank god everything that jesus received as a son of god it was his divine right he was truly the son of god all of those things you and i we have received by divine grace as the adopted children of god go heirs with christ jesus if we share in his suffering we have a hope we will share in his glory because he's going to share he's going to give his glory to us now that glory is not for us to brag again in revelation it says they all put those crowns in front of him and said holy 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 is the lord god almighty So this morning let us introspect our own lives. Are we thankful to God for who we are in Christ Jesus? We are no more of the flesh. Please do not carry any guilt in you. And that's what I want to stress this morning. That am I destined to hell or will I go to heaven? That's a that's not a question that we need to ask. But let us look at our life that do we live a sanctified life? A life that declares on the goodness of god that declares that you are children of god a life that exhibits the the fruit of the spirit love joy mm. peace and patience a life that looks for the kingdom of god to be established here on earth righteousness peace and joy in the holy ghost in the holy spirit is the kingdom of god we need to check on our lives is a walk with jesus progressing or is a walk with jesus regressing we are going down let us all close our eyes as we pause for a moment and introspect on our lives where do we stand in our relationship with christ are we thankful thank you jesus for when i am in christ jesus i am no more condemned it's not because of what i did it is all because of what you did for me through christ jesus i am eternally grateful lord i am eternally grateful None of the efforts that I would make would ever qualify me to inherit such a great blessing. For the life of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. I am no more going towards death. I am freed from death. For the Holy Spirit empowers me to give me victory i still struggle i still struggle but it is because of the holy spirit that dwells in me i can be victorious the holy spirit has changed our nature from that of the flesh to that of the spirit we are no more fleshly we are no more people who are mastered by the flesh but we are being mastered by the spirit of god that dwells in us the holy spirit confirms our adoption you and i we are adopted that means natural children of god sons and daughters of god what a great privilege and blessing that is 
Thank you, Holy Spirit. It is because of the plan of God through Jesus Christ that we can call God our Abba Father, a great privilege that we carry. Our prayer is that, Lord, that when we struggle with our old man, when we struggle with the old nature that is in us, may we be reminded that he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. That your Holy Spirit makes his dwelling in us, makes his home in us, and that we have to be led by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this morning, Lord, we pray that we need more of your Spirit, Lord, more of your Spirit in our lives, that we may live lives that is acceptable in your sight, O oh God. For all the requirements of the law has been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. But Lord, we have to please you, Lord. We are under an obligation to your Holy Spirit. We are under an obligation to you, O oh God, because you are the one who's changed our lives, Lord. May on, on an everyday basis, may we be reminded, O oh God, to feed our spiritual nature, to feed our spiritual nature, to water our spiritual nature, O oh God, so that we may grow in you, Lord, more and more into you. Enable us, O oh Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, we ask this prayer.